Good morning. Good morning. Good to see you guys. Welcome to church. I'm Daniel, one of the pastors here. Uh, we've got a couple things. Just find your seats. Uh, today's a good day. It's Palm Sunday. So a good day to celebrate today. Thank you, Josh. Thank you. you can do it one more time louder. Woo! There you go. There you go. Got a couple things coming up um, this week that I want to let you guys know about. Um, if you guys can pull up the Pine Road Derby picture, pull it up. Do you see it? The Pinewood Derby. If you, this Tuesday, this Tuesday, six fifteen. Anyways, welcome to come. It's right there. All right, Pinewood Derby. Uh, the cars you make for little kids. All right, we're gonna have a race in here, six fifteen this Tuesday. If you want to come see it. All right. Um, the odds are, if uh, Buddy's in here, he's probably going to win. All right. Oh, there he is, Buddy. You know, he he doesn't. He just came to see his competition. What we're doing. I feel that was a little cheating, but you know, it's Buddy. All right, but it's gonna be a fun time. The kids have a great time. The parents are over aggressive about it, but it's still fun. So this this week, this Tuesday, six fifteen. If you want to come, all are invited. Just come have a good time. Um, this Thursday is Monday Thursday. We're having a Monday Thursday this week, seven p.m. Um, it's a great time of celebration, remembering what Christ has done and what He is doing for us today, but what He's doing done this week. All right. Um, so it'll be this Thursday um, in here, seven p.m. So feel free to come, invite friends, invite family. A uh, good time of just reflection. And then this next e Sunday is Easter, a Resurrection Sunday. Um, it's going to be a great time of celebration. Um, we have breakfast 9 a.m., all right? So if you want to come eat some food, 9 a.m. in here. Uh, if you don't want to come eat food, we're still going to do it, 9 a.m. in here, all right? And 9.30, we're doing an uh, Easter egg hunt for the little kids. So just kind of you know what's going on time-wise. And then we're going to have main service over in the big sanctuary, main sanctuary at 1015. So if you want to eat breakfast, 9 a.m. in here. All right. So let me pray for us as we get into service today. Jesus, we thank you for this day. We thank you for another day you've given us. We thank you for uh, this Palm Sunday um, as you we're going to celebrate and remember um, the beginning of this week leading up to your crucifixion. And we thank you that you what you went through for us, um, that you came here on purpose for us to suffer and die for us. And I pray that we'd not forget any of this. Um, and I pray today we'd celebrate, remember, and we just point everything back to you. Speak to us today. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. Good morning. Before we continue with our Sunday service, I would like to share something for our call to worship. And today, again, um, as uh, Daniel said, that today is Palm Sunday. And this week, I was, I was thinking about what would be a good call to worship is I think about that. It's in the scriptures, but I think about that in my head, like a movie, is that when Jesus coming in with a cult and people are waving uh, palm branches. And I think about like that me and Stephanie talked about this. And we think we, I thought about that he knew he was going to die. And he still went in any way. Everybody, he knew that everybody is going to betray him. The people, the same people, is the, the same people who's waving um, palm branches and his 12 disciples is going to betray him. And he still did, did it anyway. He still died for our sins anyway. And that is, um, uh, that is a perfect example of his love for us. He still did it anyway. And as we do our worship service today, may we be, may we be reminded of what he had done. And as we continue to, to seek him and know who he is, this is the God that we serve, that he still did it anyway. That is, um, I invite you to stand with us, and we're going to sing uh, great things for the beginning of our song for our Sunday service.
is a hallelujah in the middle of the mystery. I raise a hallelujah. Fear you lost your hold on me. I'm gonna sing in the middle of the storm louder and louder. You're gonna hear my praises roar up from the ashes. Hope will arise. Death is defeated. The King is alive. Oh, sing a little louder. Sing a little louder. Oh, sing a little louder. 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 I'm gonna sing in the middle of the storm. Louder and louder. You're gonna hear my praises roar up from the ashes. Hope will arise. Death is defeated. The king is alive.
the praise of your glory for you are raised to life again you have no rival you have no equal now and forever god you reign yours is the kingdom yours is Good morning. Wasn't that great worship? Amen. I love the I Raise a Hallelujah. It's a great song. I love it better if I can stand between Pastor Dan and Esther so I can be praising in the middle of the storms. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, the jokes are free. Um, this is a great week. We have a Palm Sunday is the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem, but is even more triumphal is his exit out of Jerusalem as the res risen Lord and King. Amen. Amen. So let us, uh, we are going to go into a time of offering as we continue our worship, and so the ushers are going to come forward as we uh, just pray a blessing over this offering. Uh, dear Father, we thank you for this day. I thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to worship you, Father, to celebrate what you've did so many years ago for us, Lord, that we can have hope, we can cheer, um, we can rejoice in knowing that the end of the story isn't, isn't Good Friday, Lord, but it's Resurrection Sunday, Father. So, Lord, we thank you for who you are, Lord. We thank you that we can come here to celebrate you and celebrate the ways you continue to save us in our lives each day, Father. I pray, Lord, for a blessing over this offering, Lord. May it be used to bring more people to that knowledge of your love, and the fact that you just bring grace upon all of us, Father. Pray, Lord, that you bless this money and use it for your community, Father, to change lives in Upland and in the world beyond. So, Lord, we lift this time up to you in Jesus' name. Amen. beyond my failure there is a still voice that silence all my fears even the worst of my mistakes a miracles in the making a miracles in My eyes I am healed with one touch. I am made whole. You have spoken, and I know that it is so. In the storm, you are peace, and your love won't let me go. Every season, 
Your purpose is unchanging. In every moment, you're working for my good. Jesus, the rock that never fails. Your kingdom will not be shaken. Your kingdom will not be to be in your presence, that we can trust in you, and that by your stripes we are healed, and that is the truth of what you have done on the cross for our sins. May we be listened to you, Lord, as we listen to Pastor Perry, and may we be amazed of what you have done to us. In Jesus' name we pray. All God's children say, Amen. Well, I want to start out with a question that actually I didn't even think about this as being a little bit personal when, when I wrote this down to open my uh, message here. But I'm wondering what you think about men who cry. And then I thought about it, I'm like going, wow, maybe I'm talking about myself here. Because for those of you who have been around at all, uh, know that every once in a while, uh, 
I get a little bit of a leak in my eyes, and I think they're just wearing out as I get older. But the reason I ask you this is because there's this football player, and I don't know if any, any of you uh, follow the best team not in L.A., and that's the Philadelphia Eagles. But recently, recently uh, they're a starting center whose name is Jason Kelsey, uh, retired from playing for the Eagles. He's played for 12 or 13 years. You will know him as the brother of Taylor Swift's boyfriend. Okay? So, <laughs> I know I'm talking to the wrong crowd here. Just humor me. Humor me. I'm from another planet. Travis Kelsey is, uh, is Jason Kelsey's brother. We were going to put it up here, but I didn't get it back there fast enough. But so when when recently Jason Kelsey retired from the Philadelphia Eagles, he cried as he made the announcement and it made the news because, quote unquote, guys don't cry. He cried when he talked about his teammates. He cried when he thanked the team owner. He cried when he reflected on the smell of freshly mowed grass on the football field. Is that him? There you go. My butt. My butt. <laughs> Thank you back there. He cried as he remembered his father crying when he was drafted. He cried through pretty much the whole announcement of his uh, retirement. And through all of this, his brother... Uh, Travis Kelsey cried as well. So it, they're just a, a bubbling, blabbering mess. What struck many people, and this is what kind of made the news, besides the fact that he's, he's a Hall of Famer to be who uh, just retired, it was seemed strange that men like this uh, would cry. Uh, both of them are jocks who play a violent sport. Uh, Jason, is, uh, Jason chugs beer. I think his brother probably does too. And Travis dates Taylor Swift and both swear like sailors. So don't look up any of their like interviews or anything like that because uh, you will be taken aback by them. But what people were noting and commenting on is that as if it's a new discovery that men cry, that this is an unusual thing, especially for jocks like my dear bro Jason. You can take him down now because we're not going to talk, talk about him anymore. It is interesting to note that Jesus cried too. I, would, I don't know if I'd call Jesus a jock, it's not noted that he dated anybody in the scripture. But he was a strong man that we find in this morning's, uh, in some, this morning's uh, scripture that Jesus cried as well. John 11.35, you all know this because you would use this as your, your memory verse when you'd have these contests in Sunday school class. Does anybody have a verse memorized and and your hand would go up and you would say no not that one <laughs> you got to play along with me what's john 11:35 jesus wept do i get a prize you you need to move back a few rows you you can't play no not any verse jesus wept and you know the context of this was when he, uh, he came and his, his friend Lazarus had died in the 11th chapter of John, and Jesus was there and everybody was weeping. And I'm not sure whether Jesus was weeping because he was sad because his, his friend had died, because moments later Jesus was going to raise him up from the dead, right? So Jesus was going to see him alive again or if Jesus was crying because of the unbelief of the people that surrounded him. Either way, the scripture tells us succinctly that Jesus wept. 
you go to Hebrews chapter 5, verse 7, it says, During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with loud cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. In other words, Jesus, while he was here on earth, he would pray for us with a loud voice and with tears. I think that's pretty cool. Hebrews 5, 7. Well, in this morning's text, in Luke chapter 19, in the whole context of what we call Palm Sunday or the triumphal entry, we see Jesus cry as well. And I don't know why I pulled this out th this week. It may be kind of the world in which we're living right now. Marta and I were watching the news the other night, and uh, as we do in the evening, and I just turned to her. I said, is it just me or is the world on fire? Literally, the world on fire as we receive news about Moscow and, and Haiti and and Ukraine, and Gaza, and all of these places around the world, I was just going, you know what? This is not fun watching the news. Well, in this morning's text, I'd like you to turn to Luke chapter 19, verses 41 to 44. And again, this is in, in, in the context of the what precedes it in Luke chapter 19, verses 28 to 40. This is days before Jesus' crucifixion. This is what we call Palm Sunday. This is a time of Jesus gathering up his dis uh, disciples and crowds of people coming around and Jesus being proclaimed and coronated as King of the Jews and celebrated as God's son. He sends the disciples to go, and what did he send them to get? What? He, he went to get a, a donkey, or the colt of a donkey. You would have had to have gotten the big mama colt, or big mama donkey, to bring baby donkey along, because baby donkey had never been written. Roger, uh, what's, what was the baby called? Is it a colt? It would be a colt, and it had never been ridden. And so once it's ridden, would it have changed title? Would it become donkey? I don't know. Yeah, but there's a, a gap, I guess, fifth grader, sixth grader, seventh grader, eighth, ninth grader. So that the baby donkey would have been the baby donkey. Okay. Well, this was the first time this colt had ever been ridden, and so they had to bring mama and the colt, and Jesus, the scripture tells us, sat on the colt of the donkey. And, and many people just think that he wanted to show how unique he was as a king, being the first to sit on this donkey. He rode this uh, on Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday, for us, should be a time to recognize Jesus for who he is and for what he came to accomplish. And we've already sang these beautiful songs of adoration, proclamation, Hosanna to him who comes in the name of the Lord. This is Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday is the coronation of Jesus. It should be the happiest of days. But in the midst of what should have been a happy day, a joyous occasion, we find this passage. And if you want to follow along, this is Luke chapter 19, beginning with verse 41. Again, the, the Pharisees have just rebuked the crowd and said, Jesus, these people are proclaiming you as the Son of God. Tell them to shut up. And Jesus says, you know what? If they keep quiet, verse 40, the stones themselves will cry out. Isn't that amazing? Jesus said, you shut up the people, you're going to get, you know, you're going to get rock shouting. So pick your, pick whatever one you want. But then verse 41 is directly after that. It says, as he approached Jerusalem 
and saw the city, he wept over it and said, if you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you, against you, and encircle you, and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. Let's pause and just commit this time into the Lord's care. Lord Jesus, um, we get the cheers, but we often forget the tears. And Lord, we are here in worship today to proclaim you as King and as Lord and as coming Savior on this, the beginning of your last week on earth. The Lord speak to us this morning just as well of these cheers that turn to tears. And may we, may we hear your heart in the midst of being in your word. In your name we pray. Amen. I've called this from cheers to tears, and it is an uh, amazing uh, putting together of, of circumstances. And I honestly don't know. I've tried to imagine this as Jesus is being led down the road to Jerusalem, sitting on this colt. He is, he is being led, and, and people are laying down their robes. And uh, we don't know that it's palm branches that they're waving, but they are bra they're waving branches in adoration of Jesus. It's a big deal. It's a parade. It's a party. And they're celebrating. But I don't know at what point or how Jesus stepped to the side once he saw J Jerusalem ahead of him. How he, in the midst of all this, stepped to the side and with tears running down his face, proclaimed these words, these words of judgment over Jerusalem. And I ask this question, it's on your outline, why did Jesus weep over Jerusalem? In these few verses, 41 to 44, that we often just kind of skip right on over to get into the Passion Week, why would Jesus weep over Jerusalem. Let me give you three things. First of all, in verse 42, it tells us that they missed what would bring them peace. They missed what would bring them peace. Jesus was not coming as a conquering hero. He was not coming as a violent overthrower of Rome. He was coming as a man of peace sitting on a donkey, which was representative of someone coming as an emissary of peace. Zechariah chapter 9, verses 9 to 10 are there on your outline. This is the prophecy of how Messiah will come to Jerusalem. Notice how specific this is hundreds of years prior to Jesus being there on the Mount of Olives, riding into Jerusalem. Zechariah 9, 9 to 10. Rejoice greatly, daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem, see your king comes to you righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will take away the chariots from Ephraim and the war horses from Jerusalem and the battle, battle bow will be broken. He will proclaim peace to the nations. His rule will extend from sea to sea, from the river to the ends of the earth. This is the prophecy of Messiah coming to Jerusalem, coming in peace, riding as a, 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 a king that comes in peace and not in violence, riding into Jerusalem. And, you know, one of the ironies here, brothers and sisters, you know what Jerusalem actually means? 
Jerusalem literally means God's peace. Je Shalom, Jerusalem. It was intended to be the city of peace inhabited by Messiah. Matthew 23 is a, another, a, another word of Jesus about Jerusalem. Matthew 23, 37, we looked at this in Bible study, men's Bible study, just the last week or two. Jesus says, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing isn't that an amazing image that Jesus uses of himself that he desires? He, he says, I'm, I'm, I'm like a mother hen, you know? Y'all, I'm like a mother hen. We, I long to gather you under the safety of who I am, of, my, of, of me being Messiah, of me being the Prince of Peace. I desire you to come. But you're off chirp, chirping, peep, peeping all over the place. And he says, you were not willing. They missed what would bring them peace. The second thing that this scripture tells us why Jesus wept over Jerusalem is that he knew they would be destroyed by their enemies. They would eventually be destroyed by their enemies. Uh, look at uh, verses 43 to 44. Jesus says, The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground. These are harsh words. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another. You say, stuff like that really happened? <laughs> there was a historian called Josephus who was embedded in the Roman army of Titus in AD 70, about 40 years after Jesus proclaimed these words. Jophis, Jophis, Josephus, excuse me, the Jewish historian was embedded with the Roman army. And he said, a band of scavengers, when Rome came to, to take over Jerusalem and destroy the temple, a band of scavengers smelling food broke into a house and realized that a woman was roasting a portion of a body over the fire because it was all she had to eat. They resorted to cannibalism because they did not recognize Jesus 40 years later. And then they succumbed to their, their enemies coming in and just literally wiping them out. The armies that finally conquered the city of Jerusalem and its inhabitants set the temple on fire. The beautiful temple of Herod, they lit it on fire. And Josephus tells us the heat of the fire was great enough to melt the gold which overlaid the the structure. The fire was so hot that the literally the gold that plated this beautiful temple just melted down into the stones. And Josephus tells us that soldiers were so anxious to obtain the gold that was hidden down between the huge stones, they literally started to tear them apart. It'd take many of them to tear them apart Fulfilling Jesus' prophecy, the temple and the city were laid to rubble by the armies with not one stone on top of each other because they tore them apart looking for gold. Jesus said to whoever would listen, this is going to come upon you. You will be destroyed by your enemies for not recognizing the coming of God to you. And this is the third reason that Jesus cried. They did not recognize the time of God's coming, Jesus says. Look at verse 44 again. 
They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. What a terrible thing to not recognize that a person for who they are and and to miss them completely. One of the saddest events in my life was in New York City. We were there with the three girls. And uh, that, you, pro- I, I, you probably judge me all the time. One of my favorite artists is Sting, the lead singer from The Police from way back. I think he's one of the most brilliant songwriters around. So anyway, we were in the, we were in the uh, New York City, the height of, of his uh, being famous. And we were walking up Fifth Avenue, I think it was Fifth Avenue, and the girls, uh, of course, they wanted to stop in every shop, and they wanted to stop in, was it Pac Sun? They wanted to stop in Pac Sun, which we have like on every corner here in, in our area, and they wanted to go in Pac Sun, they wanted to shop. We're like, oh, we're in New York City. They wandered around, I'm checking my watch, and I'm like, I saw a crowd up uh, in, in Central Park, just at the lower part of Central Park, I'm like, oh, dang. What is, what's going on up there? Come on, girls, out. You don't need this stuff, out. And we walked out up there, and we walked into a crowd, and everybody's applauding like this. And I'm like going, who was it? Who is it? Who is it? And they said, Sting just gave a free concert, and he just ended the concert right there in the park. It was like the worst time, worst day of my life. And I asked him, I said, did he sing Englishman in New York? And they said, oh, yeah, it was marvelous. It was marvelous. I'm like, no. When you miss someone, you miss something of significance. That's not significant, significant even compared to what we're talking about. But they, the people in Jerusalem did not recognize the time of God's coming to them. Imagine having God God come to you. He's up there on the hill. He's ready to come to you. He wants to set you free. He wants to bring you peace. He wants to set things right in the world. And you miss him because you're thinking, he's going to look like something else. He's going to be riding a white horse and be in this great armor with these armies coming along beside him, behind him, and he's going to set everything right in the way we think he should set things right. But here's Jesus, not only the Son of God, here is God in the flesh, riding on a little donkey with people like going, yeah, King of the Jews, Hosanna, and and. And everybody in Jerusalem's like going, are you kidding me? What, is he going to come and try and overthrow? Is he going to be Ju- Jesus Caesar? You know, this, this is a joke. This is a joke. And you know why they missed him? Because he didn't fit their mold. Brothers and sisters, our king comes in a way that people do not expect. He didn't have armies. He didn't have bullets. He didn't have ballots. He didn't have things that, he didn't have placards. He was simply the sinless son of God who had come to save people from their sins. And they did not recognize the time of God's coming. And so I want to ask you three questions for Palm Sunday, and this this may be one of my shorter messages this morning. Again, I don't mean to rain on our parade. I mean, it's Palm Sunday. I mean, get out there after the service and have a great time and wave some palm branches. But this is serious stuff as Jesus stops and says, Oh, Jerusalem, if only you had known that it was me. Three questions for Palm Sunday 2024. What brings us peace? What brings you peace in your life? Is it everything being right in the world? 
is that nothing but good news on, on, on uh, Fox or CNN at night? Is it what brings you peace? Because what Jesus is saying to us is that he is the one who brings us peace. Jerusalem is, is a symbol of all of our hometowns and cities. We could weep for all of our neighbors who don't know anything about what makes for peace. Think about their families. Think about their marriages. Think about their, their, their lives apart from Jesus. They don't know what makes for peace. Their loneliness and their destructive patterns. If they were really aware of the heartbreak, if we were really aware of the heartbreak in average towns, I believe we would weep more than we do. You had a good cry recently for the world around you? I don't know. I'm not suggesting that you go out and do that. But, but Jesus is saying here that there is brokenness all around us. And if only they knew that he was bringing peace to them. So I was out doing my yard, as I, I often do once a week, because I enjoy it. Thank you very much. I do it because I enjoy doing my yard. And it gives me a chance. People pull up and talk to me and make fun of me. They said, you know, you could hire that to be done. I'm like, going, I know, but I enjoy it. Anyway, so... Uh, some neighbors pulled up, and we banter a lot, uh, uh, this guy and I, and he and his wife were in the car together. I, I noticed she was kind of made up. She had her makeup on and stuff, but we banter. I said, if you weren't so old, you could get out here and help me rake these sticker balls, you know, those types of things, and he makes fun of me, and blah, 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 and just so happened, according to the Holy Spirit, had to be the Holy Spirit, I just said, Hey, what are you guys up to today? His face fell, and she turned straight. He said, well, we're going to see our family for the, the first time in 12 years. I said, wow, it's a long time. I said, what brings you together today? And he said, the suicide of a nephew. And he said, uh, what's, what is really hard, getting back together with family will may, be made triply, doubly, ex you know, much more hard by the circumstances. He says, that's where we're headed. I'm like going, God, thank you for making me be so no nosy. I am that nosy neighbor that asks people, what's going on? And I said, and I know they aren't, I don't, I don't think they're necessarily walking with God. And I said, wow. I said, our family's been touched by that as well. I said, can I, would you feel comfortable with me praying for you as you go? And you know what? You you really step out on the line when you're you're talking to neighbors that you you really no, we're not Christians like we are anyway. And he said, by all means, we would welcome that. And I was able to pray for them and pray that God would minister during this time and bring healing to them and bring his peace in the midst of this, this crazy thing that they had to go and do. And, and, and I just blessed them. And I said, you guys, you'll be in my prayers. And so they... They went off, and I texted him later on in the week, and he said, he goes, you know, it must have been a coincidence that you asked us where we were going. And I said, God, you know, I don't live by coincidence. And I was able to share there that my God of peace offers peace wherever there is hurt and brokenness. I said, that was a God thing. And I said, you ask for prayer anytime you want, you know, because, because that's what we're here for. What brings us peace is my first question. What brings us peace in a world that's so broken 
It's Jesus. And it's by his spirit, like we talked about last week, it's by his spirit that he guides us forward. He gives us a, a sixth sense of, of what people need and reaching out to them and blessing them and praying for them and crying with them and hurting for them. It's because Jesus lives in us and gives us peace. And we just offer his peace. I don't have anything of my own. I'm just saying, hey, but what I have, I give to you. Because I have experienced the one who came on Palm Sunday, was proclaimed the Son of God. And I, I offer you the peace that he wanted to give to Jerusalem. But they didn't want it. So brothers and sisters, what brings you peace will bring others peace as you minister to them. The second question are we allowing our enemies to destroy us? Are we allowing our enemies to destroy us? Have, do we allow space between us and God? Do we kind of hold God at arm's length so that the enemies can come in and, and fill in the, the breach, if you will? I don't really know how to describe this, but, but Jesus here is so specific about the spiritual blindness of the people and their hard-heartedness leading to a national ruin, to, to terrible things happening to them, and they did happen. And brothers and sisters, I want to ask us, are we allowing our enemies to destroy us? Or, or are, are we staying close? Are we staying close? In this book, are we staying close to God through his Holy Spirit so that we will not allow the enemies of this world to do what? To build an embankment against us, to encircle us on every side, to hem us in, to dash us to the ground, and our children within our walls, Jesus said. In other words... Are we ready to stand with God who will help us to stand against those that we would consider enemies around us, those who would attack our children, those who would attack our, our families, those who would attack everything that we know is right and decent and correct? Will we stand with God and not allow our enemies to come in and dash us to the ground? Think about our children and about how here at, at Upland BIC, children are really the, at the forefront of those we need to protect and, and stand with. I think about our, our, our children's ministries. I think about our ministry of Daniel and Aya and some of the, some of the guys going into our, the schools around here. I think of those who are embedded in our public schools and those who are doing homeschooling as well. They're interceding for their children. Think about our high school ministry and our young adults ministry. I think about our, our preschool and our day camp. Our preschool is filled to the gills. There is no more space because people want a place where their children are going to be safe and taught and raised up to be protected from the enemies of the world. Brothers and sisters, that's good news. Now, I want you to go over there after this. We put in a new playground uh, matting and stuff like that. It looks way cool. And those kids are going to be running like crazy on, on Tuesday as they open that up again. And then, Daniel, what's the date of uh, day camp beginning? June 10th. On June 10th, about how many, how many kids are going to be here on campus for day camp, just ballpark. 120 other kids. That's besides our preschool, right? Pray for, for Daniel. Who else uh, is here that's on that preschool team? Who else is here? No, the leaders. Bella's on that. Who else? Benny's on that. Joseph. Over here, I mean, 
And brothers and sisters, you need to pray and lift these people up. Thank you, Bella. I see that hand. Because we will not allow our enemies to destroy our kids. We need to put a line on the ground and say, anything that we can do at Upland BIC that would be a blessing to children born and unborn, we're standing with them so that God's blessings would flow upon them. Are we allowing our enemies to destroy us? I would say, let us say no to the enemy that will come and seek to dash us on the ground. And finally, do we recognize our need for God? Look again at what Jesus said at the end. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. Brothers and sisters, I don't know if you realize it, but when we're in the midst of a world that's on fire, and we're in the midst of a world that seems to be bearing down on us, it is a time now more than ever that we need to reach out and recognize our need for God. It's no longer time to just kind of be kind of a lukewarm kind of uh, churchgoer on Sunday mornings and, you know, all of that stuff. We need to recognize our need for God. That is what Jesus said to Jerusalem. And unfortunately, they thought they could do it on their own. And 40 years later, which was exactly a generation at the end of that generation, Titus and his cronies came over the hill and absolutely laid waste to Jerusalem. And honestly, it's never been the same since. Jerusalem has never been the same since. And I guess what I want to say, and I, I again, we're, we're in the midst of this parade and the cheers for, for Jesus, but brothers and sisters, there need to be some tears for us understanding that we need God in our lives. Do we recognize that, that need? To reject God's love breaks God's heart. I don't know where I got that, but that's written in the margin of my Bible. To reject God's love breaks God's heart. This morning on this celebration, this beautiful day of, of cheers going up, of Jesus being the, the Messiah and the Son of God, of all of his followers and, and the garments being laid down and the donkeys going forward and people waving their branches. In the midst of that, brothers and sisters, do not forget that we need to recognize our need for God. And I put there uh, at the bottom of your, your outline, I don't do this all the time. I did it last week, and I did it this week. It's a, what I would call a prayer of repentance. And I didn't know this, but uh, Linda Storm brought this to my attention. Is Linda here today? She's not today. Well, I'll tell her she inspired, inspired pastor. They, all, all over our nation today, there are prayers going up for repentance. And repentance basically means a prayer recognizing our need for God in ourselves and in our nation, in our schools. It is a time to recognize that we need God. And so I want to lead this, this prayer here at the end. You can pray it too if you want, but there's no obligation. I call this a prayer of repentance, but it's also a prayer of tears. Because I want to say this loud and clear. Real men and women do cry. And we need to cry more often, more often over the state of the world in which we live. And that's not meaning, that I'm not being a downer Debbie here. I'm here to be real and say, 
you know, is there a better time for us to say and recognize our need for God? Let's bow our heads. If you want to read this as, as I offer this prayer, I call this a prayer of tears, a prayer of repentance. Let us pray. Lord, give us the gift of repentance. We don't even know how to return to you. As we think about your church, we don't even know where to begin. We come to you in tears. We come to you in hope. Help us to know that Jesus is our true peace. Help us turn from our sins that allow our enemies to gain victory over us. Help us to recognize our need for you every moment of every day. We pray on behalf of ourselves, our children, our grandchildren, and for the body of Christ in America. We, like the church in Laodicea in Revelation 3, know that even though we are rich and feel like we don't need anything, still we are poor and needy in your sight. We pray that you would open our eyes and that we would realize our true condition before you and repent of our sinful ways. Lord, save us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. And you know what, brothers and sisters? Maybe in tears is the very best way to begin this Holy Week. Because, boy, what Jesus goes through on this week leading up to Resurrection Sunday, next Sunday, there's a lot of pain and a lot of suffering and a lot of tears. But the good news is that Jesus cries with us, he cries for us, and he cries over us. And I would pray that the tears of Jesus would be a baptism for us for this week going forward, that we would recognize our sinfulness before him and we would receive his forgiving power, which consummates on Resurrection Sunday. Are you ready for the journey? Let's do it together. God, thank you for this morning. Thank you for your blessings. Thank you for your tears, even as they arose out of the cheers Lord, help us to realize how much we need you and how much we need to turn away from our wicked ways and turn towards you so that we might have peace and light. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. In your kingdom. In your.
face the day. In your presence, all our fears are washed away. Because when we see you, we find strength to face the day. In your presence, all our fears are washed away. Wash away, Hosanna, Hosanna, you are the God who saves us, who worthy of all our praises, Hosanna. I'm a mess. I just wanted to keep singing it all afternoon. Brothers and sisters, the good news is, is that through Christ's tears, he saw fit to go directly into Jerusalem, suffered for us so that he might be crucified on our behalf. But on Sunday, he rose again. Would you join us again and bring all of your family and friends? They are going through things you don't have any idea about. They need to be here over in the big house on Sunday morning. So I won't bug you anymore, but let's do Hosanna one more time. Sure. Hosanna. Hosanna. You are the God who saves us, who worthy of all our praises. Hosanna. you as you go and may you enjoy the peace that comes from knowing Jesus the righteous one amen, amen. and amen <laughs> sorry you guys no, I, I, I was trying to communicate I did not, it was awesome thank you